This week on Gravel, we celebrate the polar vortex by swapping our best cold hunting stories. We find out how a 22 rifle can solve all of your septic problems. Don't shoot the roof, though. We go over negligent discharges, and frankly, we learn the coolest way to be able to tell a boy ant from a girl ant. Entomology and cold weather stories, this week on Gravel. Well, uh, good week to uh, the Gravelier universe. This is Andrew McKeon reporting from Eastern Montana, where it's uh, the coldest week I can ever remember. In fact, I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how cold we've all been, but I want to celebrate a benchmark achievement. We hit 41 degrees below zero on Thursday. The reason I celebrate it is we've been stuck at 39 below for years, and I just I, I've been I've been looking for 40 below, and it just it's flirted with me, but hasn't shown up and stayed. Well, it's it showed up, and it stayed. So, my euphoria is slowly uh, transitioning to just sort of numbness. But for a while, I was really happy about it. Well, on behalf of Minnesota, let me offer some grudging respect for 41 below. That's 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 emerald ash borer killing weather. There, that's that's good stuff. That sounds awful. I mean. <laughs> Like the Ber- Bergman's rule would should should predicate then that all people that live in Glasky Clow, Montana, are like three hundred pound oversized versions of what humans look like in the rest of the world. God, that's so dumbly cold. Oh, oh, we're a we're a large race, large race oh. here. I don't know that Bergman's uh, rule counts when you can put on additional clothes. <laughs> you know, when you live in the state that is the manufacturer of you know, Sitka gear and First Light, I think. Oh, wait, First Light's in, in Idaho. Sorry. I want to apologize to the people of Montana for signing a business that isn't one of theirs. Um, but, there's, you know, there's plenty of good uh, clothing companies. I think that offsets Bergman's rule. I think that only applies to animals that don't have the ability to layer. Mm, could be so. Or airplanes. Well, we, uh, we talked a little bit about... Um, cold stories. And I, I actually have one from this week that I, I intend to tell you, but this cold reminded me of the last, I guess no, I'm not going to say last, the first Montana cold snap I endured, which was, well, I can tell you, it must have been the winter of 89 and 90. So it was my very first winter in Montana. I was uh, a displaced Midwesterner running the newspaper in Wolf Point, Montana. And I had this little Nissan Sentra with four ply tires. And the thing it was just, I hated the vehicle, but it got me around. It was pretty reliable. But the first Christmas I was in Montana, I decided to take the train, the old Great Northern Empire Builder Amtrak, back to uh, my homeland in Missouri. And because I was a newspaper editor and kind of a one man show, I had to scramble and put out two newspapers in a week so that I had a newspaper ready to go while I was gone, which kind of erodes the whole idea of the news and newspaper, but whatever. Uh, so I was running all around town in my little Nissan Sentra, and I, the, the streets were pretty snowy. And I remember coming around this corner a little quicker than I wanted to, and I was, I was actually a little bit worried about skidding. But instead of skidding, all of a sudden my car just stopped in the middle of the turn. I had broken the bead on all four tires at once. They were so cold. The sidewalls <laughs> were so stiff oh, that they really? it couldn't handle the, the torsion of the turn, and all my tires went flat at once. What? <laughs> so that was pretty cold, uh, but it got colder. So I finished my scurrying and hurrying around town, and I got on the eastbound train in Wolf Point, Montana, so this train goes through uh, Bronson land. It goes through all of North Dakota into St. Paul. And then there's a southern bound uh, version that goes to Chicago and then eventually to um, St. Louis, where my folks were going to pick me up the next day. We were I was bundled on the train, thankfully leaving the ice box of Wolf Point behind, and my disabled car was in my past. Uh, just enjoying the view out the window, the frozen prairie. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon you know, right before Christmas. So it was getting pretty dark, pretty fast. And the lights flickered in the, in the, uh, public, you know, the observation car. 
and then went totally out and we glided to a stop. The entire train stopped. No electricity, no power in the train. And because of the thin skins of those, you know, aluminum or stainless steel siding, all of a sudden it started getting chilly. I mean, I bet it dropped 20 degrees in about four minutes and was headed even farther south. Nothing happened, nothing happened. Everybody's kind of restive on the train. All the passengers are wondering what's going on. Conductor comes through and says, we've got a disabled train. All the passengers are going to have to get off. Well, we are, we're west of Minot. must have been about 15 or 18 miles, just in the middle of a wheat field. All the passengers had to get off the train. It turned out the uh, diesel was burning. Number two diesel didn't have kerosene to thin it out, and the diesel fuel in the locomotive had gelled. Gelled up. Gelled up. So all the passengers were out on the siding in the middle of this wheat field uh, waiting for a bus. So a, finally a bus came, but people on that train got pretty accustomed to North Dakota cold in a short order. I think it was 30 below by the time the bus came and there was a wind that had picked up. We ended up taking the bus all the way to St. Paul. Oh. So if it's cold, if it's cold enough to gel the fuel in a diesel locomotive, it's cold. So you guys sat on the side of a train. Yeah. How did you survive? Did yeah. you bundle together? You're cuddling with the guy. And... Everybody kind of bundled together. It was the most forlorn view, though, to see all the luggage being thrown out of the luggage car of this train into snow drifts on the side of a wheat field in North Dakota. Like, there's no coming back. You guys that. didn't even have a tauntaun to kill and cut open and stay warm inside of. <laughs> God. I bet you guys look like a bunch of penguins standing there in a in a heap. Did you, like, alternate who had to be on the outside of the bundle? <laughs> well, we, we, we definitely uh, communed because, you know, I had come from a pretty cold spot. I mean, cold enough to flatten all my tires. So I had winter gear, but there were a lot of people who had gotten on that train in Seattle, the point of origin, who were not equipped for that cold. So everybody was kind of sharing winter coats and hats and whatever we had. So I have this image of Andrew with his typewriter because this is 1989, right? So so I'm just assuming you didn't have a computer yet. You had a typewriter and you're a newspaper man and you had it in a leather satchel and you had that on your feet like an emperor penguin egg and you were just shuffling around keeping it out of the snow. That's my you image. Know, what does it... What disappoints me about that image is that you don't have me somehow setting up and clickety clacking out a story of the experience. Oh, I've I've got you. You know, you you've you've got your your pencil that you had been behind your ear. You know, under your fedora, your fedora has got a tag in it that says press, and you're you're just going and asking human interest stories from. Well, I'm 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 picturing the 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 aristocratic blonde woman with a with a you know big furry fur lined coat you're asking her about her experience and maybe she's also got some uh she's got some flamingo feathers or some heron feathers in her hat yep yep yeah so it's it's a we're jumping from you know we're it's it's an f scott fitzgerald theme at, at, at some point <laughs> i mean we got the great gatsby going here so Maybe you're wearing a tuxedo because you're dressed for dinner on the train because, you know, you're not a Cretan. I do remember uh, it was one, I, one of my first train trips, especially, uh, you know, big old passenger train. I think I had jumped a few freight trains in my past, but the Johnny Cash song, you know, smoke about a Folsom prison, watching the train go by and guys mm -hmm. smoking big cigars in the dining room was what I was thinking about. But that's my cold story. Yeah. I've got another one, but I want to hear yours, Dinger. All right, so I grew up in northeastern South Dakota, um, probably not far longitudinally south of where uh, you live today, e either of you. By the way, is Glasgow north Latitude. of the city? Latitude. Latitude. Is Glasgow yeah, as a map guy, I should know that. Um, is Glasgow way, how far north of the cities is Glasgow latitudinally? Yeah. Highway 2, so it's like on par with Crookston. Right or Detroit Lakes yeah. or okay, yeah. so it's I don't know two hundred miles north. Okay, maybe? so I grew up in uh, spent a lot of my childhood in Redfield, South Dakota. So we were used to the cold. Um, moved down to Minnesota where uh, Dad was going to take me on a duck hunting adventure, and probably every duck hunter in the eighties and early nineties knows where this is going. But 
uh, we didn't duck hunt like people duck hunt today. Um, we stood in the reeds, uh, or at least, you know, you, you don't get a lot of buzz and press these days for standing in the, in the marsh. Uh, we were standing in a sheet ice march, marsh, and it was sleeting, probably 27 degrees, something like that, wind blowing like crazy. Shouldn't have been there to begin with. And I'm stand, sitting on a bucket uh, in the reeds with my feet in the water, um, in waders that were hand-me-down waders that were three sizes too big. And guess what? The waders don't hold water. So not only am I wet right away in the morning, but the shooting is brisk. And so we're out without a dog trying to retrieve because our dog wouldn't go get the ducks because it was cold and dogs have some sense. So we would wade out and uh, get our ducks. And so um, I ended up separating from my dad to go get a duck that had downed a ways off. Um, and I walked about halfway around this little slough we were hunting and um, wait, waited out to get this duck about the same distance that we were standing in the reeds on the other side of the slough and dropped in my waders to, you know, within an inch or two of of the top of my waders. And, and every duck hunter knows where this is going, but I hadn't accounted for the fact that the wind was blowing toward this side. And so I thought I was okay and I took another step and a wave crashed into my waders and mm-hmm. I was in sheet ice and the the middle wasn't the middle of the of the water was open but it was it was you know blowing the water up over the sheet ice and I was standing on the edge of the sheet ice so anyway um every duck hunter has been there uh, that grew up duck hunting probably but I was wet to begin with and already freezing cold but then my waders filling with ice cold slough water in in Minnesota was the coldest I can remember being uh, ever. And then we, we decide that we're going to tough it out because there's ducks and geese flying all over the place. And I remember it as clear as if it were yesterday. I had never shot a goose at this point, not a dark goose at this point. Um, and these like charity geese fly over right over our head. And I was shaking so bad and I was so cold <laughs> that I missed. And we were about a half mile from the truck. And it was at that point that uh, dad went and got his goose and, and we – walked out of there but i'm sure you guys have both had water in your waders but i don't remember a time when i was as close to hypothermic as i was that day i don't i don't remember how long it took me to warm up but what i remember about being that cold was how bad it hurt to warm up it was weird have you guys ever been so cold where it hurts to warm up like my toes burn (laughs) most of my experiences with that were were hockey related out skating when it was really cold outside i mean that's when you when you took your skates off and your feet started to warm back up and it just shooting pain, yeah, yeah it, it, it's no fun. And uh, strangely, my dad actually told that exact story this weekend. He was down from Minnesota, and so uh, it's pretty fun to know he remembers it in the same way because he was wet too. And oh my gosh, one of those one of those stories that like my son will probably never have because I'm such a yuppie now that I probably will have him hunting in a blind or in a pit or you know, in layouts, and I don't know that he's ever going to be. Oh, I bet he'll, <laughs> he'll probably hunt with the nanny. Oh, yeah. Ouch, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she'll have an extra pair of equestrian boots in the trunk, you know, from, from uh, equestrian classes. Uh. <laughs> well, that was a long play on that ouch. one. Well done, Bronson. Ouch. <laughs> Actually, I know I know Bronson, being a uh, northerner, has got a good cold story, but I can't let the opportunity to tear onto yours go by. So this I'll make it quick, but my friend Steve Dalby and I were hunting uh, ducks at the tail race of Canyon Ferry Dam. This is uh, it's near Helena, Montana. There's a, three reservoirs. Canyon Ferry Dam then transitions into Hauser Reservoir, and he had some intelligence that all oh, the ducks were just stacked up in the tail race of Canyon Ferry, so we launched his boat on Hauser and took his dog and his decoys and uh, it was cold. We set the decoys out. We shot a few ducks, but not enough to justify all that work. And it was getting really cold. In fact, there was starting to be skim ice on the reservoir. So we thought, let's pick up the decoys. So Steve goes and gets his boat from around the corner where he had stashed it. And he runs it up on the beach, kind of a gravel beach. And we're picking up decoys. He's one way or the boat on the other way of the boat. I turn around and I see the boat is 
not on the sandbar anymore. It is starting to drift into the reservoir. And uh, Steve turns around and sees it exactly the same time I do. And he's, for the record, closer to his own boat than I am. But he says, McKean, what are you going to do? I'm like, what, what do you mean? And I said, I had the presence of mind to say, you've got a retriever. Send your dog after it. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. He didn't think it was so funny. And he was just par- he was paralyzed. He didn't do anything. So we were faced, and this was a long way from civilization. I bet the nearest house was eight miles. So I had to make the snap decision to go after the boat. So I'm in big old chest waders, and I just dive into the water. The boat's probably 25, I bet it's 20 yards offshore, but it's going out. You know, in the first stroke, I'm like, I got to keep my chest up so my waders don't fill with water. But after like the second thrashing and kind of, you know, uh, freestyle stroke. Of course I tip forward and my waders fill up with water. Oh. So I'm committed at this point. I got to go. So I kick to the boat and luckily it was cold enough. My, I reached out and my gloved hand froze to the gunnel because oh, otherwise I don't think I could have held it. And I kicked back to shore while I'm cold. I am dang cold. So we get the boat started we got to run four miles to the boat ramp and I mean, it's cold. Now there's skin ice forming on the reservoir. I am just totally blue faced, blue lipped, trembling in the bottom of the boat, trying to stay out of the wind. Steve gets, gets the boat loaded onto the pickup, turns his pickup on high. I'm down on the floorboards, just trying to suck up every bit of warmth that comes out of that heater. By this point I've shed my wet waders. And speaking of the, just the pain, the intense pain of warming up, like little bits of me are warming up, but my core is still just absolutely just shut down. <clears throat> and I'm down on the floorboard, so I can't really see what's going on, but I don't want to get up where I can see because I'm going to lose this little plume of heat I've come, got coming out of the freezer or out of the heater. And uh, I can tell when we kind of get off the gravel of the state park where the boat ramp is on the highway and, you know, Steve's just rushing to get me home, get me into warmth. And he turns onto my street. I lived in town at the time. The greatest injustice of the entire trip wasn't that his dog did not get the boat, wasn't that it was his boat that I retrieved. I mean, there was lots of little sort of wounds of this whole thing with the greatest injury Micro, of the whole Microaggressions. Year. Microaggressions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> microaggressions. The biggest injury of the whole thing, he... Came down my street so fast to uh, get me delivered to home quickly that he couldn't stop and he hit my pickup <laughs> parked in front of my house. <laughs> I guess better better your pickup than a pig, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that hitting a pig was a reference to, uh, dear listener, to a previous story that you should listen to if you haven't. Yeah, check out the archives on our Facebook page. Okay, that was my... I know I got two cold stories. Well, I've got a couple of different directions I can go here, because being a Minnesotan, yes, I have cold stories. Now, the coldest I've ever been is playing hockey out on the pond when it was 10 below. That's the coldest I've ever been. But this isn't a, a podcast about hunting, uh, hockey stories, so it's got to be hunting-related. The, the coldest I've ever been while hunting was, in my younger days, uh, on full moons during the winter... If it was clear and, and the moon was out, we'd go out and hunt coyotes and fox at night because you can't use illumination. But when you had a full moon, you could go out and hunt them. And I was out one night, and it was probably 10 below, um, not much wind, and my my call kept freezing up. I had a, a, a cottontail rabbit distress call that you would blow, and it kept freezing up, so I had to keep pulling it into my jacket to warm it up. And... You know, so I ended up killing a, a fox that night with buckshot out of my 870. And uh, so as soon as I killed one, I said, okay, I'm done. It's too cold. And I started to go in. And by the, by the time I got in, the and it's, it's you know, a 300-yard walk back up to the trailer house that we had at the farm, that the, the, the blood and everything was frozen and the fox was completely stiff such that I couldn't skin it. I had to bring it inside into the trailer house that night and warm it up enough so that I could skin it in the morning. And the did you know that the uh, uh, 
Fox will carry uh, fleas through the winter, and the fleas live on them through the winter. Well, I didn't know that, uh, but I found out the next day when I had fleas all over me and ended up having to bug bomb the trailer <laughs> house because I had brought fleas in in the middle of the winter, you know, in 10, deg- 10 degree below weather uh, that, that came off the fox that I brought in. But since, since Andrew told two, my best duck hunt ever took place in middle of November in a thunder blizzard in, in Minnesota. I was hunting a, a little lake, hunting uh, divers, and it was snowing. I think we got about 8, 10 inches of snow in that storm, but it was early enough in the season and it, it, there was enough energy in the system that there was thunder uh, that I would hear while I was hunting, and it was blowing so hard that when I went out to hunt... You know, I, I hunted out of a little 10-foot uh, John boat, not terribly stable. And I realized, okay, I it's too windy to be out there and, and manipulate decoys and everything myself. So I, I set up my gang rig of 12 decoys, bluebill decoys, on shore, drug around to the uh, the, the downwind side of shore, or the upwind side of shore, and then went out, you know, into the wind, uh, or with the wind out there, dropped my decoys as I went in and tied up to a cottonwood tree. And I shot my four bluebills, which was what the limit was at that time. This would have been the mid 90s. And each time I, I didn't have a dog at the time because I was a college kid. And when I every time I shot a bluebill, it would hit the water, skip a couple times, roll over, the white belly would be sticking up, and then the wind would just blow it across the bay. And so when I shot my fourth <laughs> one, I untied, went. You know, got in the wind, I had an electric trolling motor on the boat, and I went and I grabbed my the, the string of decoys, and I missed the first decoy, I got the second one, and then I was fighting to keep the, the, the decoy line out of the trolling motor, because that would have rendered me, you know, inoperable. I The wind blew me across that, that bay in 30 seconds, it took no time to get across it, and I mean, it was just <laughs> howling. And I hit the shore, and there's my four decoys, or my four bluebills, all within 20 yards of each other, sitting nicely on the opposite shore. I pick them all up, throw them in my, my duck boat. My hands are frozen, not more from the wind than anything else, and, you know, and I'm wet because, you know, from pulling decoys out of the water. And the cottonwood trees that I had been tied up in on this, this lake that was the water levels had been rising, I turned back and I looked, and a bolt of lightning hit a tree. It couldn't have been 100 yards from where I had been sitting. And it, it, to this day, it's the best duck hunt I've ever had. And I've had some pretty cool places in, you know, around the country and things. And what I realized is that the best duck hunts, you are always on the brink of death. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes a really <laughs> good duck hunt. So Wow. But speaking of water... Did you guys know that you can use water to to uh, sex ants and insects? If you take a bunch of insects and throw them in the water, the ants that sink are girl ants, and the ants that float, boy ants. <laughs> That's better than where I thought you were going, which was you know the human attitude, which is the ants that sink are the witches. Well, that's because they weigh the same as a duck. You literally just laughed at a joke that started with, speaking of water, <laughs> jeez. Hey, wait a minute. 1.75 kins. So, I... No. No, no, no. Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half kins. It, it, had, it had context. It had a natural segue. Speaking Digger, that was way of, better than most of your segues. Speaking segway, of you water. Like, yeah. <laughs> We had we had all been speaking but, of water. But so, well, doing a little autopsying of that though. Now I'm wondering if the whole duck story was made up. Could be. Nope, true story. Just to get to the joke. He is in for the long no, play, I, isn't he? He loves the long when, setup. When I was trying to figure out yeah. how to segue into it, I thought, okay, how can I bring up pheasants forever and talk about pollinators? And pollinators could bring me to ants, and ants then I could do the girl ant sink. Boy ants, they float. I think, I think we float. have to. Boy ant. We have to introduce the 
McKean Bronson bias into the canometer because there is a steady twenty percent bias for <laughs> jokes. He is a funny, funny man. He's hilarious. He is a man. Michael Ken. <laughs> no, Bronson. Oh, I mean, if if I'm not laughing by the time you finish a joke, there's twenty five. Something wrong with me. Twenty five percent McKean Bronson bias. <laughs> Do you think so it's just because we I don't like summer, summer cows? <laughs> is that what that's about? <laughs> you talk about talk about little injuries. <laughs> He's injured. So, he's injured. So one person on this podcast has the most Jack Pine Savage, dirty redneck, coon ass story I have possibly ever heard. Will you tell us that story, McKean? Unreal. <laughs> well, all right. So this is the most contemporary cold story I have. It's from Saturday. So Saturday. So it's been colder than hell here. I mean, just cold. That forty-one below, uh, moderated into the. 20s below zero, but a nasty east wind has accompanied it. It is cold. And it's really, I think it's 21 below tonight with, oh, something around a 20-mile-an-hour wind. It's just unpleasant outside. Well, as I've mentioned to our listener, we are uh, residing in a pretty new house. This is our first winter in our new house. And there's just a lot to know and learn about it. But uh, one of the unpleasant things I learned about it was Saturday, I'm sitting in a um, meeting convened by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. All of the hunter ed instructors, hunter education instructors in this part of the state get together once a year to talk about you know, our program and classes and all that stuff. It's fun. I used to coordinate the program, so a lot of the people I see there are folks I recruited for the volunteer positions they still hold, so pretty fun. Um, and Mark Cloker, the uh, department guy who now runs the program, and asked me to actually talk a little bit about our mentoring um activities of this past hunting season is, you know, just something that hunter education instructors should know about and maybe participate in. And anyway, so I was kind of, I wanted to stay around for the entirety of the, of the workshop because I was kind of toward the end, but at lunchtime, my wife texts me and she says, Hey, uh, our house is full of sewer gas smell. Like it just, we, it's like our house is get, we're getting asphyxiated in here. It's awful. So I text back, like, uh, you want me to come home right away? She's like, yeah, yeah, let me figure out what's going on. So a little bit, she's like, I th- I, I, think we've got one of the uh, bathroom vent pipes is plugged up with snow. Then my, my one of my boys texts me. He's like, Dad, I'm getting the ladder out. We're going to go up on the roof. Well, it's a, it's a metal roof with a standing seam pattern. It's slickered in hell. Stick, slick, slicker than deer guts on a doorknob up there, especially with uh, snow on the roof. So I, I forbade him from doing that. And, I mumbled my way through my mentoring thing and I get home and uh, the stench has dissipated a little, although, you know, you never quite get rid of it. You still taste it in the back of your throat a little bit, <clears throat> but the active sort of sewage plume has gone away. Quick, no quick question. Are, are, are you guys on a sewer system or you have septic? No, we've got a septic system. Okay. So it's all your own family. So, poop. Okay. good. It's all our own stuff. In fact, kind of the punchline of this, I'll tell you now. Saturday night, I had to go to the bathroom, bowl number two, and I actually said as I flushed the toilet, I looked down in the bowl and I said, I hope I never see you again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so, you know, the man of the household is back and got to figure this out. So I look around at the, the, the vents. We got PVC plastic vents that come out, you know, the roof to vent the bathrooms and anything that's got water. And each one of them has this frosty plume on top. So clearly they're getting occluded. You know, the, the wind, there's a bunch of cornices of snow on the roof. And as that wind came out of the east, it started to uh, basically granulate that snow. And I think some of that humid air coming out of the vents made frost caps on them all. So I'm like, God dang, how am I going to get those knocked free? The roof is too tall to get my tractor of the loader up there, and the, it's, it's, the south-facing slope's pretty tall on the house, so it's way too tall to get a ladder against the side of the house and somehow get up there. And I was going to have one of my kids get up on that roof, so I was like, how do I remotely get rid of that cap on the vent tube? How would you do it, Bronson? Um, 
Well, it probably would involve some sort of harness going all the way up and over the house to the other side with a with a rope. Yeah. Um, I'm going to guess. Uh, That's exactly what I thought about, but then I'm like, how am I going to throw it up? And there's not a lot to hold it. So, actually, I thought about, first thing, uh, Ellis has got a pretty good arm on him. I thought, well, maybe... Maybe he can throw a snowball up there and start. But I'm like, I don't know. That's. Then it hit me. I'm gonna shoot it off. There we go. <laughs> so I had the kids get my little 22 with a scope on it. I was and, gonna uh, introduce a CCI solution to this because that's the solution to so many problems was, in life. It it was the stinger came in handy. But, you know, I wanted to make sure that the, my rifle's on. I haven't shot it since the fall. I, Thanksgiving Day, we were shooting it quite a bit. So I uh, confirmed at zero and then got all set up. And uh, I, I don't really, you know, I just came from a hunter ed workshop. Know your target and beyond. Well, I knew my target, but I had no idea what was behind it. I'm shooting up into the air. I got in town was that direction. And it's, you know, it's four miles away. But still, you know what they say on that box of Stinger, CCI Stinger? Can be lethal for up to a mile. Well, there's homesteads in the mile radius. So I finally had to get situated where I kind of felt like it was just open lands, wherever that bullet might go. And it took me two shots, but I shot it off. Nice. Saved the family. We can all breathe easy now. The stench is gone. And uh, in the springtime, I will be up patching the uh, the hole in that PVC pipe. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> That's a good trade-off. I feel like Jake Edson so right this... here would, would tell you that you are an elite Jack Pine Savage. Agreed. <laughs> so this this segment of Homeowner's Dilemma is brought to you by CCI, the leader in rimfire ammunition. <laughs> Manufactured in Lewiston, Idaho since 1952. See, a, a better man would, would come up with some dad joke or pun based on blowing the shit cap off of your roof, but I, I just don't have it. <laughs> well, actually, I've got actually two legitimate segues off of this. I want to return to the Hunter Ed theme in a second, but one of the things that we talked about in that Hunter Ed workshop is this past year in Montana, there were four shooting uh, incidents, two of which uh, ended in fatalities. The other two were pretty egregious. Um, it was a bad year for firearms related accidents in the in the hunting field in Montana and so we you know as hunter ed instructors we take hunter safety and firearm safety as kind of our first order of business so we spent quite a bit of time talking about that and one of the interesting things is um, so one of the fatalities in Montana involved uh, a couple of elk hunters best friends uh, these fellows are probably in their late 50s 60s and uh, they were together. They shot an, a bull elk. It went down, but there was a second bull with the one that went down. And as they approached the one that went down, and, and these guys are apparently just um, manic about, or at least conscious about, not carrying a uh, loaded round in the chamber. They had, after they confirmed that the first bull was down, they cleared their guns, put, you know, put the live shells in the magazine, closed the bolts on empty chambers, and walked up. But as they're going up, they're like, well, that other bull might be there we should probably have a round in our chamber. So they both chambered rounds, walked up to the downed elk, and sure enough, that second bull was nearby. They were kind of getting on it. The hunter who had shot the first elk slipped his gun, discharged, and he killed his buddy. Mm. Uh, the guys actually got a video on Facebook. If you, you can search for it and find it, and he talks about what happened. It's, it's really pretty compelling. We'll try to put a link to that on our Facebook page. But... One of the things that the guy says in that video is um, he's been amazed at the number of people he told the story to who have recounted their own experiences with accidental discharges. So one of the things we did Saturday at our Hunter Ed workshop is we went around the room and there was probably 35 of us in there, all experienced hunters, all certified hunter ed instructors. There were only three or four people in the room who had not had an accidental discharge in their careers. It was amazing. I mean, it was, it was really an eye opener to me. So you know, one of the things that we, we did as a group was to really pledge to, um, personally, to confirm that when we're big game hunting, we're not carrying a loaded a gun with a loaded round in the chamber. 
and to really preach that in our classes, which we do a pretty good job of. Um, you know, upland hunting is a little different. It's hard to effectively upland hunt without a loaded round in the chamber. But I guess just one real sober takeaway from this discussion is it's real. And I think if you ask your hunting buddies, <clears throat> start to canvas the people you know who have hunted for some time, I think you'll be amazed at the prevalence of accidental discharges in our collective past. Hmm. Um, but that also got a discussion about different actions, firearm actions, and the ones that are more predisposed to being problematic in terms of either ensuring, you know, checking to see if a chamber is clear or, or not, you know, and, and it got me thinking the, the gun I actually used to solve my little sewage problem or septic problem was a, a new England arm single shot 22 with exposed hammer. It's a break open action single shot. And it's one we've actually got probably three or four of them in the household. The reason is we've won them all at conservation uh, banquet raffles. They're usually on the kids table. Um, you know, I think it's a classically conceived, great first gun. It's a single shot, real simple to operate, breaks open, but it's super problematic for a beginning hunter. You know, it's got this, doesn't have a safety. The safety is uh, the hammer. When it's relaxed and down, the gun won't fire. You have to physically pull back and cock the hammer, and now the gun will go off. But a lot of times, especially with a beginning hunter, they don't fire. So how do you disable that? action how do you put it back on safe you've got to relax that hammer on a round in the chamber it's super problematic we talked a little bit about 1022s i love the 1022 but that bolt doesn't lock open mm -hmm. so it's hard to see you know if if there's a loaded round in the chamber you've got to really peer in and really know what you're doing with the magazine out because if you rack that you know that semi-automatic slide back with the, with a loaded magazine it's going to pick up another one when you when you let that bolt go again so I guess that's the second thing in terms of the public service announcements of this particular podcast is be careful, especially with these kids' guns, um, guns that are are um, typically looked at as, as first guns for kids can be pretty problematic in, in terms of disabling them and clearing that action. Any other actions problematic for you guys? Yeah, I think for me, the lever action is they've become a lot less prominent in deer camps in the upper Midwest, but they're still real common. I mean, 3030s, you know, Marlin 336s and Winchester 94s are, are real common. I've got a, a 94 22 just because, you know, I've all, I always wanted a lever gun to play cowboy and Indian with since I was a kid, but I didn't want one for deer hunting because I wanted a real caliber. And uh, so I've got a 94 22 and that's one thing that I noticed that, you load that, that tube magazine up and you'll have, I don't know, it holds 14, 15 rounds, I suppose. And the only way to empty it is to keep racking that lever, you know. And so as you're doing that, that hammer's back. Yeah, and, the chamber. And, you know, you're putting one in the chamber every time. I suppose you can pull out the tube and, and pour them out the other end. Um, but that's pretty cumbersome. But one of the things that I see is that, you know, the, 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 the lever action 30-30, or 300 Savage, or whatever you had, uh, was a lot of people's gun for a long time. And then when bolt action guns became more popular, and this is, we're talking the previous generation, you know, the, the old guys upgraded to the 30 out 6, and the 94, or the, the lever action in, in the gun safe, ended up becoming the, the new kid's gun. And so the so many kids here in Minnesota, their first deer rifle was using their dad's lever action. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of inherent safety issues. It's, you know, it's the same thing. It's exposed hammer and a repeater and hard to unload and things like that. And then one of the issues that I've, I've come across, you know, so uh, at least at the airing of this podcast, my company still owns Savage Arms. And we've got the little bolt action uh, rifle called the Rascal. And one of the things I like about the Rascal is that you, you, it's a single shot. And you can open up the, that bolt action without having, without putting the uh, the action, the the safety on to fire. But there's other rifles out there on the market in those micro rifles, you know, beginner kid rifles, that they're bolt actions and they're single shots. But in order to open the action, you have to put it on fire. 
to open the action. And I think that's just inherently unsafe. That's one of the things I've always appreciated about the design of the Rascal rifle is that you can keep it unsafe to open it up. So those, those are a couple of my thoughts. How about you, Dinger? Yeah, I think, I mean, you guys are well beyond where I'm at gun-wise. Um, I will say that something happens a lot uh, when we're pheasant hunting is uh, guys will have uh, rounds in the chamber, obviously, and we're kind of Nazis about making sure that the gun's on safe uh, because you can't really pheasant hunt without a, a, gun, a, a shell in the chamber when you're pheasant hunting. Um, but several different times, uh, I can think of one just a couple of years ago where a, a dog tripped a guy and he had his gun off safe and he shot straight forward and there's blockers at the end of the field. And, you know, he's 50, 60 yards from the end of the field, but had there been a blocker there, I mean, he'd have killed him or, or hurt him really badly. And so, I mean, I think that this topic of, of gun safety is, is really a warranted conversation. Um, I will say, though, that you know, so much of, of mechanical safety comes down to the individual running the machine, right? And so mm-hmm. I think it's really smart that Hunter Ed spends so much time on safety. And I, I think for what it's worth, you know, there's probably situations we've all seen ourselves in or even been in and, and continue to put ourselves in where there's a safer route. And I know after hearing uh, stories like people getting shot reaping turkeys, you know, sitting behind a, a turkey fan where the, where you're carrying basically what looks like a turkey right in front of your face during turkey season. I mean, I, there's just, there's, as my buddy Scott Vance would say, there's just never a scenario where a, a turkey is worth the chance to, sh- to shoot somebody else. So, no, I think you guys have, have outpaced me. I, I know when I shoot a, a pistol, um, a lot of times that bolt problem happens um, on a, on like a 1911 or something like that. I'm not a big handgun guy, but I know the exact feeling you're talking about where you have to release the the lever by pulling the trigger with a round in the gun. It never feels quite right. So I agree with you that, that those are accidents waiting to happen. Well, that's why if you follow the first rule, you know, never point your gun in an unsafe direction. If you follow that rule, you can have a negligent, negligent discharge and it'll still be safe. Not safe, but you know, more safe, you know, so that's why the, that's always the first rule. You got to be careful where you're pointing that gun. I, I did have a negligent, negligent discharge, uh, with a, with a 1911 while I was unloading it one time. And, um, it was 100% my fault. It was a negligent discharge into the ground. And, but it, you know, I was following my, my basic safety rules. So I, I had turned away from everyone else was pointing it in a safe direction and, uh, uh, you know, and I went to strip it, drop the magazine out. Somebody asked me a question. It interrupted my, my train of thought. And then, you know, I went and dropped the hammer or went and uh, squeezed the trigger like I always do to drop the hammer after I've emptied it. But it still had a round in it and it went off, um, which scared the living bejesus out of me. Um, but I was pointing it, pointing it in the safe direction. Uh, so it all worked out, but it's it's a good lesson. I mean, even experienced gun guys and you know an experienced hunter ed instructor like me, it it can happen. So it doesn't surprise me that even your group of of jack pine savages and in, in uh, the Gleesku, uh region of the High Line of Montana had had the same problems. I was just going to say what you so eloquently said is that first rule is basically solves all other problems. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talk a lot in class about a mechanical or a, a safety as a mechanical v- device that will fail um, and never to trust it. But, yeah, that cardinal first cardinal rule is keep your keep your muscle pointed in a direction. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's, it is interesting. You know, I think in pretty much every state, um, hunter education has actually been renamed over time. You know, it, it was hunter safety. And gun safety, firearm safety was the original title of these classes. And it's interesting, we still as instructors, um, our fundamental lesson plan and the thing we hammer um, more than anything else are the, the rules of gun safety and, and, and firearms knowledge and, and observing safety rules. But you know, over time, we've added a lot more to the hunter education course. So it's a, there's ethics, there's survival, there's species identification, all those other things. But I think 
one of the things that our weekend experience really hammered home is we can't ever lose sight of our first job, and that is to ensure that the, the students who are going through our class absolutely have those rules of gun safety hammered into them. Um, the second thing I actually, I said I had two segues from our Hunter Education talk, and, and the other one is probably deserves more wide-ranging time and discussion than we have, but, you know, I've, I've grieved a little bit, obviously, with the, the, the pace and the scale of, of school shootings. Um, you know, there's an awful lot um, behind that in terms of causality, but, you know, I've always also felt like it's, I'd like to see the whole notion of firearm safety more closely tied to schools and to the curriculum. Um, for years, we taught our, our hunter education class here in Glasgow, in the Glasgow Middle School. Um, about three times a year, we would come in and we would occupy the library, and after school, that's where we'd, we'd teach the class. And at the time, it was still okay to bring in uh, our own operable firearms, so we had you know lots and lots of security issues to ensure that there nobody's bringing in a live round. Anyway, over time, we've lost that ability to bring in our own guns. Now we've got program guns with firing pins removed and they're bright orange, and which is probably appropriate to just ensure that next level of safety. But the other thing that's changed is we're no longer welcome in the school. Um, and it's fine. We've got a place to do it. We actually hold our classes here at the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks office, and it's adequate, but it's not as big and it's not as familiar a place to the kids. These are typically middle schoolers who are going through our, our class. And so I, I've been having this discussion with my brother, who's a state representative in Colorado, and he actually introduced a, a bill in this year's legislature to um, allow Hunter Education to return to schools, as it did, you know, 30 and 40 years ago in, in, in most school districts in the state or in the nation. Um, he's kind of having an uphill fight with it. Basically, uh, the idea is for the Hunter Education class to be an extension of a natural resources science curriculum in seventh grade, but absolutely no hands-on gun safety training in the schools. And that's one of the things he's had to kind of negotiate away as they looked at, at ways of getting us through the, the uh, legislative process. But I'd be curious your take on it. Um, do you think there's a chance in our modern culture to return hunter education to schools? I think there's a chance that if, if, if people make a good argument, but the, the, the problem is it, it's going to happen in rural places where it's probably not as important where we need firearm education is in more urban locations and in suburban locations so that people who don't have familiarity or experience or come across guns every day, you know, have that, that experience. You know, one of the things that I, when we have babysitters over, we always talk to them about there are guns in this house. They are locked up in the, in the gun safe. But if you come across one, you know, you shouldn't, but if you do, here's what you, here's what you do, and uh, you know even even teenage kids that take babysitting classes here in the suburbs, they don't they're not taught those basic safety rules, the Eddie the Eagle type things that the NRA talks about. Um, I'd like to say that that would solve a lot of problems, but at the end of the day, the, making a rational good argument for gun safety is not likely to win the day. That the emotions around guns are are such that anti-gunners are going to do everything they can to prevent people even seeing a gun because there's people who have an irrational fear that if they're in the presence of the gun, they think they're somehow in danger. Uh, even an uh, unloaded gun, you know, being taught in a, in a safe manner. You know, we could all make this arguments that for the same reasons we te teach sex education, the same reason we teach about drug use, the same reason we teach f driver safety is why you should have firearm safety uh, hunter education in, in, in schools. But um, it'll probably happen in places where support for gun ownership already exists and in the places where it doesn't, in the suburbs, in the rural area, in the urban areas, it, it probably never will. I'm a little cynical. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. I, I mean, I think it's it's just politically inconvenient for people on either side of the aisle to support something like that because even hunter safety includes some facet of the word gun and uh we'll jump into this next podcast but you know the sportsman's bill is a really good example where 
you know, everybody is pretty universally supportive of something like the Land and Water Conservation Act, but, or fund, but, you know, the number one funding source of that is recreational shooting, and, and we're not supportive of recreational shooting ranges at the federal level, and I think that's just a, a federal example of what's happening in municipalities, including Lincoln, throughout the country. I mean, Lincoln's right now uh, in the process of weighing holding the owner of a firearm responsible if their gun is used in a crime uh, in their home or used uh, to end a life by suicide in their home or out of their home. And that's just another example of a, you know, guns are a, are a trigger word, you know, pun intended, uh, a trigger word right now. And if, if it is in any way pro-gun, I think there's a lot of people that just it would be a politically inconvenient or, or a taxing thing for them to support anything that says gun or has gun included. And so as much as I agree with you, Andrew, that I think it should happen and it is happening, you know, Iowa, uh, had some buzz early in the, in, uh, or late in 2018 about introducing Hunter Ed back into schools and, and South Dakota is making a state level effort at it. Uh, but to Ryan's point, those are places that are largely pro gun or pro hunting or, you know, going to be introducing people at least on, on some higher than than the median percentage to the outdoors anyways and so i agree ryan i, I with both of you i andrew i think it would be great if it could happen it is happening in places where where guns aren't an inconvenient truth um but man in places where it's really needed urban areas i agree with ryan it's going to be tough is there a, andrew do you have you know you, you do you guys have ideas or thoughts on how that could change well, you know, you mentioned the Sportsman's Act, and we'll probably know more come next podcast because it's happening, you know, in live time as we're recording this at, at the Capitol. But right now it looks like the Sportsman's Act is, is in all likelihood going to pass the Senate, and, and the House will pass it in short order after that. It looks like there might be a deal. However, the House uh, leadership, which is the Democrat Party now, um, is insisting that they strip out the shooting range portion of, of the Sportsman's Act, which would enable states, give states greater flexibility to spend Pittman-Robertson dollars, which comes from guns and ammo, uh, to, to build on shooting range development so that people have safe places to shoot, so that hunter ed classes have places to, to do their live fire exercises. Um, but because it's associated directly with guns and may promote more you know more shooting and in in gun ownership uh there's opposition to that in congress so in all likelihood you guys have heard my laments about the sportsman's act how it's gotten close before in all likelihood we are going to reach a point here in the next few weeks maybe the next month where the sportsman act is going to get to a point where in order to get it passed in order to get land and water conservation fund gun owners and the gun industry the national shooting sports foundation we're going to have to swallow the pill that the things that, that's important to us, trying to promote shooting ranges, isn't going to be part of that package. Is it based on any good rational policy? No. It's just because it involves guns and, and there's an irrational uh, hostility towards them. And so it's, it's in all likelihood going to get stripped out. Um, I think that's the same symptom of the same problem that we have with, with trying to get hunter's education, firearm safety in schools, that there's just an irrational opposition to it, um, even if it's all about safety. What, what, I think the important lesson there is that uh, for the folks that talk about gun safety, they mean gun control and they mean stripping away Second Amendment rights. So those are all code words for them. So when we actually teach firearm safety with Hunter Ed and, and firearm safety classes, uh, they don't care. They, they want that to go away too because they just want the device gone. So that they can control us and institute well, their vision of communism. <laughs> okay, I went too far. Too far. Clearly, they uh, clearly clearly they have never had plugged up vents. No, no. Your Are frisbee... you gonna have to tape up your or vents they later? Have, they're... <laughs> Excuse me. You're gonna have to tape up your vents, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I want you to know that, uh, you know, gun safety in my world is ensuring that I've got a good backstop when I shoot your roof. Mm-hmm. Nice. Homeowner's insurance by CCI. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I, I want you to know that I didn't reach for a shotgun. 
that would have been inappropriate. That's right. And, and with that, I think that's the last word today, unless somebody else has one. Nope. A last word, Bronson? No, I, I got in a whole bunch of them. I even ripped on communists for a little while there. <laughs> a last word, Dinger? Tape up your vents, and if you don't have tape, shoot your vent hole open. Okay. That didn't, that, that uh, didn't make any sense, but, but the spirit of it was there. <laughs> well, mine will be a reprise of I Hope I Don't See You Again. With that, I hope I see you next week. Until then. Keep it on gravel.